What's up guys? Today we're going to start a brand new video series, how to stretch a Jeep TJ. I have a 2002 Jeep Wrangler and it came from the factory at, I think it was like 93 and a half inches or 93 inches, depending on where you read, of wheelbase. That wheelbase is fine if your Jeep is stock. As soon as you start to lift it up in the air and you start to put big round tires on it, it starts to become a little bit less stable. So my Jeep is on 40s and it's stretched to a 97 inch wheelbase, so about four inches of stretch. Um, initially, I thought it was two inches rear, two inches front, but that's not the case. I measured it, it's actually closer to about one inch rear stretch and three inches front stretch. The front stretch that's on it now, I think is perfect. I don't want to push it too much farther forward. If I was going to push it farther forward, it would be like an inch. In order to get another inch out of it, I would have to change everything up there. So the rear is going to gain six more inches, so it would be seven inches total rear stretch. Overall, the performance should go up substantially. I want to put a little bit shorter spring. I have a four and a half inch lift spring in the front right now, and so I'm going to put a three and a half inch lift spring in it to drop it an inch and stretch it six more. Looks are a factor for me as well. I like looks, I like performance. I'm always trying to find the best averaging between the two. So I like the width of the TJ and it fits on my trailer, which is important. <laughs> go too wide, it won't fit. The front tire doesn't go in front of the front bumper. I might end up shortening, there's a dead space right here. So long term, I might actually end up building a new bumper, cutting the front off the frame and moving the winch in to give me a slightly better approach angle, just a little bit better. Uh, but that is still so much less work than cutting this box and moving it forward so I can squeeze another inch of wheelbase out of this. The rear is a whole nother story. Um, <laughs> the front of the rear tire is like in front of the back of the tub right here. We've got about four inches or so between the back of the tub and the back of the tire. I prefer the look of keeping the tire inside the tub, but I really want to be around that 103 inch mark. So we're going to push the rear tires out past the rear of the tub about two inches. Before we start any of this work, we have to break this down to nothing. So I'm going to go buy some really tall jack stands, get this stable, and rip out all the drivetrain. We are ready for the next step. I've got an Atlas four speed transfer case for those of you who are not familiar and it is a giant heavy son of a gun. This entire time that I've had it, it's basically just been, it just hangs off the back of the transmission and a lot of people break the tail housing off their transmissions with an Atlas four speed because it's so heavy. We need to put a secondary mount on the back of the transfer case. So that way, all that weight is being supported on the tail housing of the transfer case and on the transmission, making it a lot better. This is our transfer case mount. Got it online by some 4x4 company that I've never even heard of. It was like 54 bucks. Might be goofy looking, but it's gonna fit our purposes perfectly. Got this at AutoZone, it's rubber. All the rest of my mounts are rubber. I wanna stay with rubber, especially because it's a diesel. And this was like $6, $7, somewhere in that ballpark. I'm gonna cut this. Fold it at a 90, and then we are going to mount this bad boy to the bottom of it. I like that way better. Now I have a secondary location to help carry the weight of all these drivetrain components. I'm going to be doing a four link rear suspension and a three link front. There's a lot of challenges whenever you're designing a system like this, and it all needs to work together cohesively. I had previously designed all of my frame side mounting locations to bolt on, and it's basically three pieces. Driver side, passenger side, and then just a middle plate that ties it all together. This is a brand new version of what you just saw that I had welded into that system before. This is made to weld directly to the frame rail, which is great. It's really convenient, strong place to mount it, 
but there's a number of issues with mounting it there. If we mount this here, what'll happen is you're gonna turn all the way one way or all the way the other way, and the back of your tire is gonna go right into the link. So if we can move these in just a little bit, it ends up giving us more triangulation and it gives us a little bit more room uh, for the turning radius of our tire. In this new suspension setup, we're gonna be running a three link in the front. We're gonna be mounting this to the bottom of the plate that I'm gonna build that's gonna anchor into our frame rails. The rear is gonna be the same thing, it's just gonna be a four link, but this lower link mount is gonna basically go right on the bottom of these plates that I'm putting together. And then the upper mount is gonna be adjustable, which I'm pretty excited to play with. So I got these mounts from Ballistic Fab. When you change that upper link location, it's gonna change your anti-dive and anti-squat numbers depending on if it's in the front or the rear. And basically what that means is the handling characteristics of the Jeep under acceleration or under braking. I'm going to use this eight inch wide by three eighths thick plate in order to be a solid mounting location that we're gonna be putting all of our bolt holes and everything through, mounting all of our suspension, uh, mounting bracketry, it's all going to go onto this plate. So I'm going to drill holes, get these mounted up in there, and then start figuring out how I'm going to connect A to B and make it to where I can mount the transfer case and transmission somewhere in between. Got these bad boys mounted in here. Lots of room to mount stuff. They are humongous though, as you can see. I'm gonna mount our brackets and everything to them and then I'm gonna trim off whatever's left because the way this sits right now, this is clearly gonna be in the way of a lot of stuff. Like I said, once I get everything mounted onto this plate itself, it'll be a lot easier to figure out what I can trim away. First, I wanna get these axles in here. We have axles in our Jeep. Woohoo! Kind of. The whole reason I wanted to put the axle in its place is so while I'm tacking these on, I can aim them at the mounts, I can get a really good idea of how everything's gonna work and how it's gonna look. I'm gonna start with the front and we're gonna start with the lower control arms. Um, there's a number of sources that I've seen where they say you don't wanna be any more than about 10 degrees. My experience, you can go super deep into geometry theory and all kinds of other stuff and you should investigate that world and learn some things about it. Um, just keep in mind that when you come back out of those calculators and you get back to the real world, packaging will be your largest problem. And at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to what you have available in terms of mounting. This is the reason I'm gonna use a three link instead of a four link. You know, like a lot of people, I have my exhaust running down one side of the vehicle. Having two upper control arms in the front is gonna be too big of a uh, engineering problem for me. So. I'm gonna use a three link. A lot of people have, are very, have very successful builds with a three link and are very happy with them. I'm gonna mount this bad boy right about there. So it's gonna be really close to where the hole was for my most recent mounting location. So if I run my tape through my existing lower control arm mount, that's gonna be about the angle of our lower control arm when we're at ride height. That's pretty good. I can put an angle finder on there and see how many degrees we're at. We don't want to be more than 10, but again, we're limited to packaging. We're limited to how we can stage all of this stuff and there's not a whole lot of flexibility. I'm gonna to want to locate my upper control arm to be as straight and as flat as possible at ride height. That looks pretty flat to me. Uh, I'm gonna be building my own mount on the axle up here. I'll be able to kind of control the height of this. Now that we have these plates where we want them, and we have the axles where we want them, I can actually go through and I can tack our mounts where we want them. And we can continue to forge ahead on this project. These are looking funky. <laughs> I directed these exactly where they need to face in order to um, line up perfectly with the opposing mount that's on the axle for the front and rear. I'm gonna take a plasma cutter, I'm gonna cut off the pieces that we don't need because there's no reason to just carry around a bunch of extra weight. This is a rim that is gonna end up being the skid plate. So the skid plate is going to weld to this rim, but this rim is gonna get bolted down with these bolts. 
I tack welded these strips and then I drilled my holes all in one shot with this tack. I wanted to make sure that this didn't move around on me and I wanted to make sure that these holes line up absolutely perfect. Because the last thing we want is, um, you know, when we go to bolt the skid plate up at the end of this, none of these holes line up for one reason or another. The next thing I want to work on is locating these upper control arm mounts. So I've got some ideas and I basically need to bolt these back in there and orientate everything in a way that's gonna be really rigid, really solid, and removable. This is really close to what the passenger side is gonna look like. This is gonna be going on the uh, inside of the frame rail. I'm gonna drill a couple holes so we can put some longer bolts that are gonna actually bolt all the way through the frame. These three on bottom are gonna go into the existing frame holes. And then this is gonna be our upper control arm mount. Link separation is very important and there's a few things to consider whenever you are looking at link separation. On the axle side, you need 25% of whatever your tire diameter is going to be. So I'm running a 40, that means that I need to have 10 inch separation. Pretty easy. Um, on the frame side, there's a number of different schools of thought on separation here. The position of your upper and lower link and the relationship to each other changes your anti-squat and anti-dive numbers. This is for the front suspension, so that means it's anti-dive. The reason I'm bringing all this up now is because the next hole that I need to drill through that little inside side plate is gonna be for this upper control link mount. So I've been sitting here playing with it and I've been getting everything where I want it. I think that this is gonna work perfect. I lined it up from the outside, I made a mark, then I drilled all the way through, and then I set this on the plate on the inside and everything looks good. Now I'm going to drill it to the appropriate size, put a bolt all the way through. Perfect. That ended up perfect. I got the upper mount right on top of the lower mount, which is what I was going for. There's a number of different ways to do this. Um, if you take this and you move it forward and you put it around the 70% mark, which is a very common way to build this setup, it makes it to where as the axle is moving up and down, it keeps your ball joints in the same orientation that you have it set up at ride height. If you have it set up the way that I have done it, then this is gonna make it to where as the axle droops, it's actually going to twist the axle forward, making the pinion uh, remain pointed at the output shaft of the transfer case. I hope that makes sense. So the disadvantage of the way that I have it set up is gonna be as the axle flexes down, it's actually going to turn forward, making it to where if I'm steering um, and it's completely flexed out, I'm gonna be steering on the front of my tire a little bit instead of on the center of the tire. Like I've said before, there is a number of gives and takes. There's, I mean, there's always a negative and a positive to every little change that you make in the geometry on suspension setup like this. I would recommend on pretty much all rear suspensions, making the upper and lower links the same length um, with a little bit of an angle on your lower link. And that's because you're not gonna have that disadvantage of steering whenever you know it, it's flexed all the way out. Um, it's gonna make it to where your pinion angle is gonna stay pointed at your transfer case, which is good for everybody. Um, now for the front, like I said, it's up to you which, which direction you decide to go. I have three friends that have three link fronts and they're all set up different. I have one who has it set up this way where it's basically the exact same length. I have one who has it set up shorter to where the upper arm is 70% of the lower arm. And I have a buddy who has it set up to where it's longer to where the upper arm is like 110%, 120% of the lower arm. And all three of them don't have any complaints. They say they don't have excessive bump steer. They said that it, it performs well. So I think that you're gonna get a lot of forgiveness just by having a longer set of links anyway. And it's gonna make it to where you can't fudge this up too bad unless you push it to its extremes, like upper arm being 50% of the lower arm or upper arm being 150% of the lower arm. I think that's when you're gonna really start to see yeah, maybe you should have rethought the way you did it. Finally, we can locate these upper control arm mounts. So, there's a couple things going on here that I'm sure some of you have questions about. This comes as a kit from Ballistic Fab, and it makes it to where this actually, I, I plasma cut it off, but this had a like 90 degree portion that was on the bottom of it, and it makes it to where you can 
weld it to your frame, and then that frame piece is tall enough for this, so it's gonna be a stronger connection. I wasn't sure how I was gonna use these, but I knew that I needed something of this orientation, and I usually just, I modify a lot of the stuff that I buy online anyway. So this is how I modified it. I modified it to stick on here. We're gonna basically weld it around to this plate right here, and then we can weld this guy to that guy. The orientation from here to here is important. Um, I want to get it as close to the same length or same level as possible. But what's even more important is that the driver and passenger side uppers are identical. So all of this has been measured um, to make sure that like these holes line up on both sides and everything else. I should be good to basically just measure off of the front of this, go back three inches then weld it there, go back three inches, weld it there, and then I'll just kinda I'll eyeball it, make sure that it is in the ballpark. And if it's in the ballpark, I'm gonna send it home. top section welded I can flip these bad boys over whenever they cool they're radiating heat right now and I'm going to clean up all of this shiny stuff this is cutting oil for whenever I drill all the holes you need to clean this off really well before you weld over it so it'll give you a lot of porosity in your welds which is where um, it looks like basically whenever you weld and you don't have any shielding gas on it it just gets all these weird like little bubbles and holes if you have this in there it'll absolutely do that so I've got some acetone. I'm gonna wipe it down really good, pull this off, and I'm just gonna, I wanna finish burning all this stuff in. By the way, another thing of note, I'm new to this machine. This is the first machine I've been able to weld for like an hour straight and not have it overheat on me. This thing has been fantastic. We are looking at a rough cut of our frame side suspension brackets. I say rough cut. Everything is welded, but like, you know, I want to clean this edge up that I used a plasma cutter on, but I know that there's going to still be some trimming and whatnot. So I didn't go too crazy with cleaning everything up yet. A couple of these I did uh, some double passes just to make sure I got plenty of penetration into that 3 8 plate. This should be very, very strong. It's very heavy, so it better be strong. Support the people who support Dirt Lifestyle. Miller Welders and Ballistic Fab are both companies that are gonna make this series so much easier for me to do. Um, having a welder that's multi-process, you know, we're gonna be doing some aluminum TIG welding here before long, a little nervous. <laughs> it's, TIG welding is hard for me. And then, you know, all these joints and all these brackets and stuff from Ballistic, it's just, it really helps to put a series like this together whenever you have good sponsors. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. If you want to follow me on social media, I am at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you on the next one.